Ken Robinson. Thank you very much. It's been a fantastic program, hasn't it? <laughs> fantastic. Um, I think what uh, this evening's been about is a different paradigm. You see, most of our current measures here in the States, and by the way, I, when I say we, I live here. <laughs> I haven't just popped over here, you know, to have a... <laughs> To have a shot at you. Um, <laughs> I moved to America 12 years ago uh, with my wife Terry and our two kids. Actually, truthfully, we moved to Los Angeles. <laughs> thinking we were moving to America, but anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a short plane ride from Los Angeles <laughs> to America. Um, and I've come across fantastic schools great teachers, great supervisors, and we've seen some examples here. There's wonderful work happening in this country. But I have to say, it's happening in spite of the dominant culture of education, not because of it. I was at a meeting recently in Los Angeles of, they're called alternative education programs. These are programs designed to get kids back into education. They have certain common features. They're very personalized. They have strong support for the teachers, close links with the community, and a broad and diverse curriculum, and often programs which involve students outside school as well as inside school. And they work. What's interesting to me is these are called alternative education. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and all the evidence from around the world is if we all did that, there'd be no need for the alternative. There are three principles on which human life flourishes, and they are contradicted by the culture of education under which most teachers have to labor and most students have to endure. The first is this, that human beings are naturally different and diverse. Education under No Child Left Behind is based on not diversity, but conformity. What schools are encouraged to do is to find out what kids can do across a very narrow spectrum of achievement. One of the effects of No Child Left Behind has been to narrow the curriculum to those areas that are tested. And what we've heard here through a whole series of presentations is that kids prosper best with a broad and diverse curriculum. The second uh, principle that drives human life and flourishing is curiosity. And we've heard it repeatedly through this program. If you can light the spark of curiosity in a child, they will learn without any further assistance very often. Children are natural learners. Teaching properly conceived is not a delivery system. You know, you're not there just to pass on received information. Great teachers do that. But what great teachers also do is mentor, stimulate, provoke, engage. You see, in the end, education is about learning. If there's no learning going on, there's no education going on. And people can spend an awful lot of time discussing education without ever discussing learning. The whole point of education is to get people to learn. Uh, um, a friend of mine, an old friend, actually very old, he's dead. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's as old as he gets, I'm afraid. So... <laughs> but a wonderful guy, um, he was, uh, a wonderful philosopher, he used to talk about the difference between the task and achievement senses of verbs. You know, you can be engaged in the activity of something but not really be achieving it. It's like dieting. <laughs> it's a very good example, you know. There he is, he's dieting. Is he losing any weight? Not really. <laughs> teaching is a word like that. You can you know, say, there's Deborah, she's, uh, she's in room 34, she's teaching. But if nobody's learning anything, she may be engaged in the task of teaching, but not actually fulfilling it. The role of a teacher is to facilitate learning. That's it. And part of the problem is, I think, that the culture of, uh, the dominant culture of education has come to focus on not teaching and learning, but testing. Now, testing is important, 
Standardised tests have a place, but they should not be the dominant culture of education. They should be diagnostic. They should help. <laughs> um, you know, if I go for a medical examination, I want some standardised tests. I do. You know, I want to know what my cholesterol level is compared to everybody else's on a standard scale. I don't want to be told on some scale my doctor invented in the car. <laughs> you know. Your cholesterol is what I call level orange. Really? <laughs> is that good? We don't know. But all that should support learning. It shouldn't obstruct it. And the third principle is this, that human life is inherently creative. It's the common currency of being a human being. It's why human culture is so interesting and diverse and dynamic. I mean, you may have a dog, and your dog may get depressed. You know, but it doesn't listen to Radiohead, does it? And, <laughs> just, you know, sit staring out the window with a bottle of Jack Daniels. And, you know. <laughs> We all create our own lives through this restless process of imagining alternatives and possibilities. And what one of the roles of education is to awaken and develop these powers of creativity. Instead, what we have is a culture of standardization. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't. Not far from where I live is a place called Death Valley. In the winter of 2004, it rained in Death Valley. Seven inches of rain fell over a very short period. And in the spring of 2005, there was a phenomenon. The whole floor of Death Valley was carpeted in flowers. The whole place had turned into a meadow, a pasture, for a while. What it proved is this, that Death Valley isn't dead. It's dormant. Right beneath the surface are these seeds of possibility, waiting for the right conditions to come about. And you've seen it in all the examples we've heard from this evening. Um, you take an area, a school, a district, you change the conditions, give people a different sense of possibility, a different set of expectations, a broader range of opportunities. You cherish and value the relationships between teachers and learners. You offer people the discretion to be creative and to innovate in what they do. And schools that were once bereft spring to life. The real role of leadership in education, and I think it's true at the national level, the state level, at the school level, is not and should not be command and control. The real role of leadership is climate control, creating a climate of possibility. And if you do that, people will rise to it and achieve things that you completely did not anticipate and couldn't have expected. There's a wonderful quote from Benjamin Franklin, who said, there are three sorts of people in the world. Those who are immovable, we meet them all day, people who don't get it, they don't want to get it, they're not going to do anything about it. There are people who are movable, people who see the need for change and are, are prepared to listen to it. And there are people who move, people who make things happen. And what we've seen here this evening, I think, are wonderful examples of people who are moving. And there are many people throughout the country also moving. And if we can encourage more people, that will be a movement. And if the movement is strong enough, that's, in the best sense of the word, a revolution. And that's what we need. Thank you very much.